Hello everyone, this is Mikey Garcia. Yo, it's your boy, the odd guy himself, Malik King Scott. Hi, I'm Charlie Edwards. This is Fast Eddie Chambers, and you're listening to the Box Hard Podcast with my main man, Joey Coastman. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the 10th episode of the Box Hard Podcast. We're in double figures now. I'm your host, Joey Coastman. I'm joined, as always, by Mr. Ayaz Sumra. Ayaz, how are you doing, sir? I'm good, Joey. How are you? Very good. Very good. OK, we're going to waste no time. We're going to get straight into the first part of this show the first part is called the review part where we go over the fights that happened last week the second part of the show is called the preview where we go over the fights that's happening this week so it's time for part one we're going to roll straight into it on the Thursday there was a card in Essex Boy Jones Jr got out he moved to five wins uh, zero losses and one draw so he got a first round TKO victory over Michael Stupart. Michael Stupart, four wins, 29 losses. He's now got 30 losses and the two draws. That was it for Thursday. We move over to Friday in Panama. Guillermo Jones returned to the ring after two and a half years out to win a unanimous decision over Daniel Cotter. So he's wrapped up his 40th win now, Guillermo Jones. Um, Also on the Friday, Conrad Cummings, this is down in Northern Ireland, Conrad Cummings, got a split draw with Alfredo Melli. Both of these guys were unbeaten. Comrade Cummings was 7-0 and and Alfredo Melli was 11-0. So both of those those guys have got a draw on their record now. And that was for the vacant British border control Celtic or Celtic middleweight title, should I say. Also on that bill, um, Marco McCulloch moves to 14. 14 and 2 he defeated Sergio Prado 11 5 and 1 Moving over to Newcastle now Jezza Dickens fought Martin Ward and Jezza Dickens picked up a split decision victory this again was for the British Super Bantamweight title Jezza Dickens now 21 and 1 Martin Ward now 22 and 3 with the one draw there's sort of you know, cards scattered all over the place. There's fighters on cards scattered all over the place. Um, we go over to Las Vegas now. This is also on the Friday, not on the Saturday. Diego De La Hoya moved to 13-0 and with a unanimous decision after eight rounds against Giovanni Delgado. So uh, a big prospect for the future, Diego De La Hoya. Jason Quigley was also on that bill. He now moves to 9-0. and It was only a four-rounder he was in, but he won that unanimously. He defeated Mark Christopher Adkins. Also in Las Vegas, there was a card over there in the Cosmopolitan. Gilberto Ramirez. Gilberto Ramirez, he moved to 33-0. and he defeated Javorg Kachakian. Kachakian now is 23 and 2. And Gilberto Ramirez, 33 and 0. Sol Rodriguez was also on that card. He picked up a TKO in the first round. He moves to 19 and 0 with the one draw. He defeated Ivan Najura. Ivan Najura now 16 and 2. Now that's it for the Friday. We're going to move over to Saturday. Um, Aya, should we start with the card in Germany? Yes, we should. I think we should start there because um, it was pretty, it was upsetting, really. Um, Martin Murray, he went over to Germany, fought Arthur Abraham in, uh, in Arthur Abraham's backyard, and unfortunately, he was on the wrong end of the decision again. Now, he's had four attempts at a world title, Martin Murray. Obviously, he fought Felix Sturm, he fought Gennady Golovkin, and he fought Sergio Martinez. Two of those uh, fights, he, he he possibly should have got the win, to be honest. I know that Kali Sauerland, the promoter of Arthur Abraham, actually said that he saw Martin Murray as a former two-time world champion coming into that fight with Arthur Abraham. But unlucky for Martin Murray, Arthur Abraham won on a split decision, uh, one judge gave it to Martin Murray. Two judges gave it to Arthur Abraham. So he retains his WBO World Super Middleweight title. Murray actually lost a point for holding 
um, during the fight. How did you, how did you see that fight, um, Ayaz? What did you make of it? I think Martin Murray done really well, and I think he actually hurt Arthur Abraham a couple of times during that fight. But again, he just seems to be the most unluckiest guy when it comes down to decisions. He really thought he won it at the end. His team thought they won it, and they're sort of um, trying to chase a rematch, hopefully in Manchester. What do you think? Yeah, um, I agree with you. What you just said. You know, after the uh, before they went to the the unanimous decision, Martin Murray, like he got so happy. Split after, decision. Yeah, split. split decision. My mistake. Split decision, right? Yeah, I saw Martin Murray's team were like right, uh, like jumping and that they thought they won the fight. I got you know to say one thing. Martin Murray is a good fighter, but you know what? Arthur, in my opinion, Arthur Abraham doesn't get a lot of reward because to be honest, that guy Arthur Abraham, in my opinion, I reckon he's a very very good fighter. You know that. He doesn't get a lot of credit. He's been in with the tough fights. He's been with Froch. Hasn't he fought Ward in the past? He has fought Ward. Yeah, he yeah. has fought Ward. He's fought some tough guys. And to be honest, like, you got to give credit to Arthur Abraham, do you know that? And Martin Murray. Yeah. Yeah, he has. He's fought a lot of good guys, you know. He's fought Martin Murray, Stieglitz, Paul Smith twice. Um, he's fought Stieglitz twice as well. Uh, three times he's fought Stieglitz. Sorry, he's lost to him. He lost to him once and he beat him twice. Oh no, do you know what? I'm going down his record and I'm seeing that he's fought Stieglitz four times. And Stieglitz is a tough, tough guy. He's fought Andre Ward, he's fought Carl Froch, yeah, Andre Durrell, Jermaine Taylor. He's got a lot of names on his record. Edison Miranda. <laughs> um, yeah, so he's got a lot of tough guys on his record. You know, he's now moved to 44 and 4. And Martin Murray is now 32 and 3 with the one draw, which was obviously to Felix Sturm. Um, where do you think Martin Murray goes from here? Do you think, because I don't want to be harsh on him, but, you know, he's world level, but he just can't win at world level. It's like he's cursed, you know, he's, he's a great fighter. And I think he should be, I, I don't think he won on, on Saturday. I don't think he won, to be honest. I don't think he won. I think he'd done, you know, he made a good account of himself. He gave a good account of himself, but I don't think he won. It was close. But Arthur Abraham, yeah, Eddie Hearn says he's underrated. A lot of people say he's shot. But to be totally honest, he's a tough, tough guy, man. He's a tough, tough guy. And, you know, he just, he throws that one-two combination and he throws it really wide. It's almost like, you know, he throws in these, like, winging shots, almost like open sort of glove from, from the inside of the glove sort of shots. And they just seem to clock everyone. I remember... Paul Smith was getting hit by him way too much. He threw a few last night, or should I say on Saturday night, against Martin Murray, and he was hitting him with them. But I think Martin Murray is just such a such an unlucky fight. I really think he should be a world champion. Anything else to add on that card? Or, sorry, on that fight, Ayaz? Or, or should I move on? Yes, I was going to add something. I'll tell you something. You know what? Fighters lose and come back. With Murray, he will come back. I can tell you that for a fight. Possibly a fight with George Groves in the future, maybe. He could fight Callum Smith, maybe. A De Gea fight would be good against him. Yeah, and again, I think that will be made. I think that Murray and De Gea, Murray and De Gea or De Gea and Murray, it will be billed as. I think that would be a good fight because not only that, but obviously they're both promoted by Eddie Hearn and I think you would definitely, definitely make that fight. But... It's not. I don't think the styles of that fight will make it too exciting, because Martin Murray is a. He hasn't really got an exciting style, and De Gale only recently has kind of turned into this knockout machine. Even though he didn't get Darrell out of there, he's he's sort of been knocking people out before that, and he's become quite exciting. But when De Gale used to fight back in the day under Mick Hennessy, he wasn't very exciting. And I just think that he won't be able to get away with certain stuff against Martin Murray. So that would be interesting. Really interesting. Moving down that card, also Dion Juma was on the bill. He moves now to 6-0. and oh, He got a unanimous decision after six rounds. That was in the light heavyweight division against Fabricio Leone. Fabricio Leone is now 6-8. and eight. That's it for, for Germany. We're now going to move over to the MEN Arena. Tell us what happened over there. Crawler shocked the world by knocking out Darlis Perez in a rematch. My word. That's, you just can say that, basically. It's crazy. Someone put it on Twitter 
someone said that 11 months ago, now I thought it was a little bit longer than that, but 11 months ago, he got hit over the head with a brick. He was laying in his house, sorry, not a brick, a paving slab. He was laying in his house on crutches. His ankle was messed up. He was waiting to hear if he was ever going to be able to put on a pair of boxing gloves again. And then 11 months later, he's world champion. It's absolutely brilliant. I'm so, 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 so pleased for him. I remember, you know, watching watching the fight on TV and just standing up and screaming and throwing fist pumps all sorts of directions. It was so brilliant. Darlis Perez, you know, he showed up. He, he looked quite positive. The way he was fighting the first couple of rounds, he looked quite positive. And I was a bit... You know, I was kind of expecting to see a new Dalis Perez, maybe a, a slightly tougher Dalis Perez, maybe someone that hasn't underestimated Crawler. You know, he was fighting quite well. He won a couple of rounds, and then Crawler just found that that left hook to the body in the fifth round, and that was it. And Perez, he was on the floor for a few minutes. You know, it was a big, big, big shot. It really hurt him. Dalis Perez now 32 and 2 with the one draw, and Anthony Crawler 30 and 4 with three draws. Anthony Crawler, new WBA world lightweight title holder. Absolutely made up for him. Um, there was a lot of people at ringside, if you noticed. There was the likes of Luke Campbell. I think Tommy Coyle was there. Um, the McDonald's were there as well. Dave Caldwell. Who do you think that Crawler could be fighting next? I know people might disagree with me or agree with me, but I've got a feeling it's Kevin Mitchell. Yeah, I mean, he's got a big fight in on December the 12th. He's fighting a big, big, big fight on that card. But providing he gets through that, yeah, it could be Kevin Mitchell. It could be Kevin Mitchell. And how would you see that going? That, uh, this is a very tough fight. One other thing I was going to add to that, your last point. It could be Kevin Mitchell... Or it could be Terry Flanagan. Yeah. See, I just don't think the, the Terry Flanagan fight is going to get made purely because he's a Frank Warren fighter and it would just be so difficult to make that fight. Not only is it difficult for Eddie Hearn and Frank Warren to sit down and make a fight when there's not a title involved, but because both guys have got a world title, I think that this fight would, would be just too much of a big fight to get made, unfortunately. You know, politics will get involved here and I don't think it will it will happen. But moving down, oh, sorry, get back to the question what I said. Who do you think would win if Kevin Mitchell was to face Anthony Crawler? Kevin Mitchell, Anthony Crawler. My heart says Kevin Mitchell, but my head, my brain says, uh, my, my brain says um, Crawler. I don't know why, because I've, you know, Kevin Mitchell is a very tough fighter. When he fought Linares, he was winning the fight, in my opinion, and Leonardo just stopped him. Yeah, Eddie Hearn mentioned that there could be a fight, you know, it would be a great fight between Crawler and Linares. I'd love to see that fight, even more than the Kevin mitchell Crawler fight. That would be a brilliant fight, Crawler and Linares. Linares is a tough fighter, and he, that would be brilliant. That would be just an amazing fight. And moving down that bill, Chris Jenkins fought Tyrone Nurse. This was for the vacant British super lightweight title. It was a good fight. Jenkins was cut on the forehead in the third and above the right eye in the tenth. I think one of those might have been caused by a headbutt. Tyrone Nurse picked up the unanimous decision win. Fantastic bit of sportsmanship after the fight from both guys. Tyrone Nurse now 32, uh, sorry, yeah, 32 and 2 with the one draw, my apologies. And Chris Jenkins, his first loss on his record, he's now 16 and 1 with the one draw. Moving down that card, Ryan Burnett fought Jason Booth. Ryan Burnett is a prospect for the future. He's being looked after by Adam Booth. He's just been signed by Matrim. It's his first fight as a Matrim fighter. He started off the fight really good. He knocked down Booth in the first round. Jason Booth's a you know a crafty veteran, 38 wins, 13 losses going into this fight. He's now got 38 wins, 14 losses, and Ryan Burnett moves to 12 and 0. Like I say, it was a unanimous decision win. Ryan Burnett started off really good, but towards the the you know the the latter rounds, he just seemed to not be as impressive as he did in the first part of the fight. I don't know if this is because I don't think he's ever been 12 rounds professionally at the moment. 
Charlie Edwards was also on the bill. He picked up his sixth professional win with a TKO in the sixth round. He was defending his English flyweight title against Phil Smith. Phil Smith is now six wins and two losses. You know, both these guys, not a lot of fights between them. You know, they're both contesting for the for their flyweight title, and it's a good win for Charlie Edwards. He moves on. Isaac Lowe was also on the card. He fought Ryan Doyle. They both had 11 wins. Ryan Doyle had the one loss. This was a split draw after 10 rounds. This was for the English featherweight title. So both guys both guys pick up a draw. Brian Rose got a win. It was only an eight-rounder, but he won on points. He fought Ruslan's. Podge Podge I've never heard of him. I don't think I've pronounced his name right, but Brian Rose moves to 28 and 3. Of course, Mandalay Bay, Miguel Cotto faced Saul Canelo Alvarez. Now, this was a brilliant fight. This was a brilliant fight. There was a round in there. I think it was one of the late rounds, maybe round 11, round 10. Or it might have even been round 12. It was one of the best rounds I've seen in boxing, to be honest. There was a round in there that was absolutely incredible. They were both throwing shots. Do you know what? I want to say, before we before we you know get into it, I just want to say the head movement of Canelo is absolutely incredible. And when he was ducking them shots, you know, Cotto was winding up and throwing big shots and Canelo was hitting him and then ducking and then jumping back up and hitting him. He was absolutely brilliant. And I've noticed that his defensive skill was so brilliant, Canelo. I know Mayweather's timing's impeccable, and you can't compare his timing to someone like Cotto. But you know, if he's shown, if he actually shown us some of the, you know, the defensive skills that he's shown this fight against Mayweather, I don't think it would have been as much of a schooling, to be honest. But yeah, Miguel Cotto, he's now forty and five. Saul Canelo Alvarez, forty six. 46 and one with the one draw unanimous decision canelo is now the wbc world middleweight title holder miguel cotto actually lost this title on on the build-up to the fight because he decided that he wasn't gonna pay the sanctioning fees whenever you're defending your title you've got to pay the sanctioning fees and he decided not to and there's a bit of speculation because the winner of this fight was supposed to fight supposed to fight uh, Gennady Golovkin, and there was a bit of speculation that he didn't want to fight Gennady Golovkin because he's not actually a natural middleweight, a natural 160 fighter. However, he lost the fight anyway, so the title has been handed to Canelo, and Canelo will defend his WBC title against uh, Gennady Golovkin in which will in what will be a unification fight. I'm dying to see that fight. Firstly, before we start talking about Canelo and GGG, what did you make of the fight, Ayaz, Cotto against Canelo? That fight was amazing. Um, Cotto, legend. Canelo, pound for pound star. What a fight it was. All I see is like Canelo like hitting it was a brilliant shot, just like not dodging him, uppercutting him, hitting him. Canelo, uh, Cotto coming around, hitting him again. But to be honest, like that was such a good fight. And then afterwards, I watched the interview, right? And I see uh, Canelo says, I'm willing to fight anyone. Get, get them in the ring now. Yeah. How do you how do you see the fight going with GGG? GGG is one of my favorite fights, right? If Me Canelo too. if Canelo fought GGG now, it could go 50-50 way, yeah. But in my opinion, I reckon got it goes to points and Golovkin wins it. Yeah, that's yeah, you see, Canelo, I think he's... I don't think GGG is very fast. It's more just about timing. Now, a lot of people say that speed... Uh, sorry, timing beats speed. It would be a clash of this because Canelo, he's quite fast. He's quite fast. He throws big shots. Like I say, he's very, very elusive. Whereas we haven't really seen that from from GGG. Golovkin gets... He's been hit a few times. We haven't seen, you know, loads of elusive work from him before. I think he's just a tough man and he'll just be on the front foot. Whereas I think he'll put Can- he'll put Canelo on the back foot. But it's tough because I can see Canelo outpointing him. But then I can see Golovkin knocking him out. But then I can't see Canelo being knocked out. 
So it's so tough, but I think that GGG beats him because GGG is just a monster. But anyway, moving down that card, Rigondo was also on the bill. He fought Drian Francisco. Rigondo moves to 16 and 0. Drian Francisco now 28 and 4. This was for the vacant WBC International Silver Super Bantamweight title, which now Rigondo holds. Zilel Zhang was also on the bill. He fought Juan Good. And Zhang picked up a win. He was down in round four. It was only a four-rounder, but he won unanimously regardless of that. So he now moves to 6-0, and oh, and Huang Good is now 6-3. and three. And also on that, on that card, I almost forgot, uh, Takashi Mura fought Francisco Vargas. Now, Mura was going into this fight 29-2 and two with two draws. Vargas was 22-0 and oh with the one draw. I'm going to let you talk about this fight, Ayaz, but I'm just going to point out, of course, Vargas was down in round four, and Mura was down in round nine where the fight was stopped via TKO. So Vargas moves to 23-0 and oh with the one draw, and Takashi Mura is now 29-3 and three with two draws. Talk about that fight, Ayaz. To tell you one thing, in my opinion, that was fight of the year. All I see is you know, Mura, yeah, dropped him and hitting him, hitting him, hitting him, right? I thought the referee was going to stop it. You see, there was one cut on the top of his eye. He was bleeding everywhere. His eye was swollen, Vargas's. And then, bam, right, ninth round, Mura, uh, Vargas drops Mura and then just stops the fight. That was, my, that was such a brilliant fight. That was, in my opinion, fight of the year. Yeah, you know, it shows. It really shows character when you get knocked down. I love it when people get knocked down, they get back up, and then they win on points. But this guy actually got back up and knocked out Mura. You know, Vargas was down early in round four. It went on another five rounds. Then he got the TKO victory, so that's very good for Vargas. So hopefully we see him in a few big fights in the future. But that's really it for part one. So we're going to bring on our first guest. Okay, it's time to welcome our first guest on this week's show. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome hot prospect for the future, English flyweight champion, Mr. Charlie Edwards. Charlie, welcome to the show. Hi, mate. You all right? Good, 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 good. It's going to be weird talking professionally to you for the first time. (laughs) Now, you was out the other day. You got a KO in your last fight. How did you feel in there, Charlie? Because you look brilliant. I know that it's on Sky. You can watch it on Sky On Demand now. So I've watched it back. But um, you look cracking in there. How did it feel the other day? I felt I felt great in there. I feel really strong. Um, right now, I'm starting with MGM. I've been training with Danny Vaughan. So I started training with him before my Lewis Norman fight for three weeks. And I had a full camp with him in my last one. So all the, all the stuff we're working on is like really paying off now. Like we're, we're gelling together. And I, I felt like, unbelievable in there. Everything went to plan. We studied um, Zill Smith and we... Um, we executed the game plan perfectly and I caught him with a cracking right uppercut as he come in. And how do you think he compares Phil Smith to to Louis Norman? Do you reckon, um, who do you reckon was a better fighter? Um, you know what? We, we looked at Phil Smith and we looked at his record and he's been in with, like, been in with Ian Butcher and supposedly he was very unlucky not to get. He lost by one point. So Phil Smith's a very very t- like tough he's a mature man so he's 29 years of age he was supposed to be tough fit but I, I don't know I just felt that because Lewis Norman weren't having a go he, I kind of think he accepted defeat like he knew that I was out boxing him and he didn't want to come in where fair play to Phil he tried to give it a go and when people were going to give it a go against me I feel that the more they come and have a go the more you'll see like finishing like knockout punches for me because I'm a very skillful boxer but I can I can punch but if someone's always moving away and not moving on to my shot and giving me the opportunity to catch them it, it won't always pay off so I'm not sure um Lewis was more of an awkward awkwarder opponent I'd say because he sat back on the back foot and I had to make me box in and out and box careful where I feel um kind of played into my hands really do you reckon, so you reckon it's a mixture of possibly um, the fighter themselves, the way they fight, and also possibly the fact that you may raise to the occasion on the night as well, a mixture of both those things? Yeah, exactly. Like um, Now, because it was like my first fight was under Danny Vaughan's guidance and things, so I was working on things, and and in my, we had a longer camp the next time, so we had 
longer time to work on things. We gelled together, and I, I feel settled. I feel settled now, and um, I, I just look forward to my next few fights under um, and Danny Vaughan. Now, as as you said, you've signed with MGM Marbella. You've had how many camps have you had out there now? Just to remind me. Uh, this is my second camp out there, but I have been over there three or four times on holidays and such, just checking the place out and things like that, getting to know everyone out there. But now I have signed with them. I've done my camp before the Lewis Norman fight. That was my first three-week camp. Last one was three and a half week. And now after Christmas, hopefully I'll get on the quick front and cards for the British, which we're going to be pushing for. And um, then I'm going to go out there and do a solid six-week camp. And what is it like out there? Because I know that it's, I know, I mean, it's lovely when you look at the photos out there. It looks brilliant. I mean, like you, you go out there, you see a lot of photos of what you do, what you do outside the gym. Is there any risk whatsoever of possibly because you're out there in beautiful surroundings taking your eye off the ball? Because I know that there's a few guys that train out there and they all talk highly of the MGM, but a few of them recently haven't had fantastic results. I'm talking about people like Tom Stalker. Uh, there's a few people, not just Tom, but not brilliant results have come out of there. I know it could just be a complete coincidence, but is there any chance whatsoever of taking your eye off the ball out there? Um, with me, there, there's no chance whatsoever. I want to go to world world honours, so I know I've got to put in the work. I've got my, I've got a great team behind me. I've got my dad there with me. He does all my food and he makes sure I'm sound. Like Jackie wouldn't let me go out. Going coming, he'd, he'd be the first one to jump on my back and things like that. So. I know what you're saying. It does look like it's living the life as such out there. But believe me, when I'm out there, I've, all I do is eat, sleep, train, repeat. You know what I mean? That's all I do. Yeah, I might lay in the sun for a couple of hours, but that's rest and that's recovery. I'm not down the pool. I'm not down there having a drink. I'm not going out late nights. I'm in bed by 10 o'clock getting my head down. So um, it looks like it's a high life, but it really isn't. It's just the better surroundings. It's hot over there. You feel better. The sun's blazing all the time. It makes you more happy, and like the food's so much, so much like cleaner, fresh over there. All the fresh fish and things like that. So that's a, a major bonus about being over in in Spain. And um, yeah, the, like the gym from where we stay over there, it's like ten minutes down the road. It beats travelling an hour if you just traffic hour and a half into London and back. It's a six hour round trip in London, and you're knackered by all the travelling. So. This is really just focus um, whole on the boxing. Okay, yeah, that's a fair point. Um, now, of course, you won your English title in your fifth fight, so that was you know seen as quite early. What sort of belt are you trying to target next, and when would we see you going for that title? Well, um, I've sat down and spoke to my management team at MGM and my trainer, and um, and I've even spoke to Eddie, and well, it's looking like. He's going to see what he can do, but it's going to looking like my next fight should be for the British. We're going to try and target um, Luke Wilton. He's a Northern Irish. Northern Irish he, he's he's um, in position to be able to box for the British because him and um, Ian Butcher's fight fell through not long ago. So um, we're going to try to target him for the Quig Frampton card solely because Eddie's trying to do an England v Ireland kind of card. So it makes sense for the card and he it'll be a cracking fight. Oh, wow. So that could potentially be your next card. My next, your next yeah, fight, my next sorry. fight for the, on the 27th of February. Oh, excellent. That would be really good. I hope that comes off. Um, now, I want to get your predictions on a couple of upcoming fights, not necessarily in your division, but just a few fights where, um, you know, they capture the public's eye, uh, big fights coming up. Of course, this weekend... I've heard you say it before, to be honest, but um, Fury Klitschko. How do you see that going, and how how do you want it to go? Um, I see it being a very interesting matchup, to be honest. Like, Klitsch, like Klitschko hasn't been against someone as big as Fury, and Fury is very agile on his feet, and he can move really well. He's a natural fighter, so I think people think that Fury's going to get knocked out easy and that, but I think he's going to really give Klitschko a hard, hard. I really hope he does it. I like Fury. He's a really nice fellow. And like, although he plays up on the camera, that's what boxing needs. It needs an entertainment factor. And it's got everyone interested in the fight. But he's a really nice guy when he's off camera and that as well. So I really want him to do it. And it will be big, big for the um, for, for not just boxing, for British boxing. It, so I have another British heavyweight champion. 
and to beat Klitschko, that would be great, great for British boxing. And there's another fight, December the 12th, that includes, well, there's two fights on that include a stable mate of yours. Chris Eubank Jr. fights Spike O'Sullivan. How about that one? Um, I think it's another interesting matchup. Spike punches really hard, and Chris Eubank, as you know, put in a great performance against Billy Joe. So um, it's a very, very interesting fight. Um, I, I would say, being brutally honest, I would like would like Spike to do it just because he's down to earth, he's a nice guy and I just think that um, Chris Eubank comes a bit across a bit arrogant sometimes and like he's not really being himself, he's like trying to do everything his dad done when really he should go out there and make his name for himself and do his own thing and be different. So I want Spike to win but um, it's going to be a great fight and it'll, I'm sure it'll be a, a close one, a crack of their both power punches and I think Spike and him have got a bit of needle between each other, so they're really going to go at it. Yeah, I can't wait for that. It should be fireworks. And also, of course, the main event, Anthony Joshua Dillian White. Anthony Joshua Dillian White. I don't see it going past three rounds myself. I know this is for Dillian White. He said Anthony Joshua is 10 times, 20 times what he was in the amateurs. He only had four fights when they boxed a guy on the back of amateurs. He beat him in the amateurs. Really, I don't, I don't see why you would even bring that up. Um, Andy Josh is a different animal, different kettle of fish altogether, and uh, I can see him becoming the next heavyweight champion. You know what I mean? After, hopefully, after Fury, and that would be a cracking fight. That would be great for British boxing as well. Now, I've spoke to you personally before a couple of times, and uh, I'm a fan, just like other people are, of trash talking. You don't really do trash talking, even though I've tried to get you to a few times. <laughs> what's your, I mean, I know you don't do it yourself, and if you don't want to do it, then fair enough. But what's your actual views on trash talking itself? Because, for example, obviously, um, a good friend of yours, Prince Patel, talks a lot of, <laughs> a lot of rubbish, and he has managed to, you know, become very, very much known on social media, just through talking shit, basically, not not yeah. for his fights or anything. And even uh, a lot of people consider um, Roman Gonzalez pound for pound. He actually knows who Prince Patel is purely through through his mouth. So do you think trash right, talking is a good London thing? And Coog and Cassius and James Elder is still to get views, isn't it? <laughs> but do you reckon it's a good thing or not, trash talking? Uh, you know what? Fair play to him. He's got himself talked about. He's absolutely terrible. And he's getting talked about, so he's done something right, even if it is trash talking. But the only reason, the only thing is the trash talking. Look at Ronda Rousey, how she trash talked May have, and now look, look at her, how much hate she got, how much stick. They always get found out in the end. Was the Ahmed? He got knocked out by Ashley Sexton. Patel is another one. He, he's, he is another one of, of, of them chat rubbish to get get his name out there. They don't even show him on Box Nation. Do you know why they don't show him on Box Nation? Because if everyone sees. Like, because he's got so much speak about him. If everyone actually see him box, they would know he's an absolute muppet. So, um, he can trash talk all he wants. He's chat- chatting rubbish about he's earning this money, that money. No, he's earning about two grand max. You know what I mean? And he's trying to hype and jump on my coach dreams just to just to get a payday. And let's be real, I'd fight him tomorrow. Eddie would ma- match it tomorrow. But he ain't going to fight me. He's going to ask for something stupid like 30 grand and he'll get laughed at because he's not worth 30 grand, you know what I mean? He's just a complete and a muppet, and I'm sick to death of him. He's just an idiot, and he, he won't even get to the title level. Someone will beat him along the way. Waladin would beat him all day. He's already beat him twice, you know what I mean? Someone who, whose career's going down, maybe like Lewis Norman, he should fight him, because Lewis Norman would beat him as well. So, um, But then Patel ain't going to fight them kind of people. All he wants is foreign imports who are, who are stupid, who are muppets. You know what I mean? So um, he's just, it's just a joke. <laughs> I'm so pleased I got that little rant. <laughs> <laughs> I was actually going to ask you about Louis Norman fighting Prince Patel, but you kind of answered it. So if you yeah, had to Patel some... fight him. He might mouth off about him, but he won't fight him. He knows it's too much of a risk. If you had to sum up Prince Patel in one word, what are you saying? Absolute prick. <laughs> <laughs> That's two, but I'll give you that. <laughs> All right, um, I'm going to pass you over to my partner on the show. I know I've kind of basically said everything. So if you've got any questions, Ayaz, then you're free to ask them. If not, then then that's fine. Just say so. So, um, yeah, bring yourself in now. Hello, Charlie. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm good, thanks, mate. And yourself? Uh, yeah, I'm not too bad. Um, Charlie, can we see you fight in America some anytime soon? 
Um, you know what? It is possible. You know, like, I've flew through these um, the flyweight rankings in Britain. If I fight for the British, win the British, then European, then I, I could be fighting. I could be fighting for a for a world title in um, the next five fights. Eddie said he he could see it. So it's it's um it's it's a very possibility, and I'd love to get out there because because it that's where like I don't know with flyweights out in the world, it's a very very tough tough um weight. It's probably one of the best weight divisions, especially now with Gonzalez being pound for pound. So um. Yeah, I could see myself being out in America in the next two years, and I'd love to. It'd be a great experience. Mm-hmm. What do you think? What do you think of like uh, Prince Patel saying, "I'm the great one"? From your opinion, like he's always saying on interviews, like, "I'm the great one." He's got to say something, can he? If you watch him, you know he's shit. So <laughs> he's got to pick himself up. He's got to delude himself somehow. Mm-hmm. And one last question: Your brother today, Sonny Edwards, isn't it true that his fight got cancelled? Was it from GB? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, his fight got cancelled. The boy um, just won a time of gold. He's come back and, like, obviously, he ain't going to want to come back and get beat off my brother, is he? So it's better off pulling out and taking that gold with him. But, um, yeah, he's, he he ain't fighting now um, tomorrow, which is a bit guttering because he wanted to get out there and prove himself. But I've told him, I've told him, your time's going to come and you'll prove yourself on the big stages. It's just a matter of time. Yep, OK, thank you. I'll pass you back to Joey. Nice one, mate. Cheers. Okay, Charlie, um, I'm going to end it on one last question, which I'm going to ask you um, live on here. Um, I'm not going to cut it out. You still owe me a Nando's. When is this happening? <laughs> when is happening? As soon as I'm back and I'm settled and my bird lets me out the house, then, <laughs> then, then I'll come and take you for a Nando's. That's okay. it over Christmas. I'm back in two weeks and we'll go out for a Nando's. All right, I'll I go. Mean, well, you have to, you got into the um, the Danny Connor fight in the West Cross Leisure Centre. Do you know what? I want to, but I don't think I will be, to be honest. I don't oh, think well, I will be. Opportunity. I was going to take you for a little cheeky mandate before, but... <laughs> hey, I was... you, using Eddie's <laughs> words. Listen, I might be around <laughs> that time, because I go away I go away on the 13th of December. I've got to, I'm going to Paris on that day. So, oh, okay. um, yeah, little Disneyland thing. But again... Proper matey chat on the podcast, but I'll leave it all in. Um, yeah, <laughs> listen, Charlie, it's been an absolute pleasure having you on the show. It's you know, it's brilliant to talk to you. I love speaking to prospects. I love speaking to champions. You're both of those things. And, of course, a personal friend of mine anyway. So thank you very, very much for coming on the show. It's been an absolute pleasure of mine. All right, nice one. Nice one for having me, Joey. And I'll speak to you soon. All right, brother. Take it easy. Right, Goodbye, you. mate. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Okay, it's now time for part two on this week's show. This part is called The Preview, where we preview the fights coming up this week. However, this show is going to be released on a Wednesday, so we've basically left out the Bradley Skeet fight, which was on the Monday. So I'm going to sort of go over that before we get into the second part of the show, because it's a little bit of a preview and a little bit of a review, I guess. It's kind of in the middle. So the fight is now took place. It's now finished. It was a a bit of a uh, strange card on a Monday night in the Hilton Hotel in Mayfair. Bradley Skeet defended his WBO European welterweight title against Stevie Williams. Bradley Skeet picked up a 10th round unanimous decision win. Um, Also on that card, Simon Barkley moved to 8-0. That was a points win over six rounds. Uh, Jay Harris was also on the bill. He moved to 7-0 and with a third round TKO. That's really it for the Monday. Again, it was a bit of a strange card uh, for there to be some sort of boxing on the, on the Monday. Um, also, on the Wednesday, so this fight hasn't took place yet, so you can listen to this. You'll probably end up listening to it on a Thursday, but if you listen to it on a Wednesday, it will still be before these fights we're about to read out. Erislandi Lara is fighting in Florida. He's fighting Jan Zavek. Now, Erislandi Lara, who we know is an absolutely fantastic um, opponent. This is for the WBA World Super Welterweight title, which is also known as the Light Middleweight title. It's also for the IBO World Super uh, Welterweight title, again, known as the Light Middleweight title um Erislandi Lara 21 and 2 with the two draws Erislandi Lara is an absolutely you know fantastic opponent in last week's show Austin Trout says that he feels that Lara is a better fighter than Cotto and Canelo because that was a big clash on last week of course the one that we um reviewed in the early part of the show 
He's now fighting a guy called Jan Zavik, and Jan Zavik has a record of 35 and 3. How do you see this fight going, Ayers? Because remember, we know that Erislandi Lara's kind of underrated. He's been on the wrong end of a few decisions. Obviously, he's got the two losses. Both of those losses were very close fights. You know, he lost one to Canelo, of course, which was very, very close. That was a split decision. He's got a draw with Vainez Martirosian. He lost to Paul Williams on a majority decision, and he's got a draw with Carlos Molina. So he's been on the harsh side of a few decisions now, uh, Erislandi Lara. So, yeah, he's fighting Jan Zavik, and Jan Zavik is a guy that I don't know too much about, but still quite a good record. He's He's got the three losses on his on his record. One was a loss in 2013 to Keith Thurman. He's also got a loss in 2011 to Andre Berto. Still a decent fighter, a decent fighter. He's got three wins on the spin since losing to Keith Thurman in 2013. Um, how do you see this fight going, Ayers? I know your knowledge on Jan Zavek's probably not, you know, so so much knowledge because again, he's not he's not very known. He's he's been beaten by a few top guys. But how do you see this going? And more importantly, what sort of future does Lara have at 154? In my opinion, I reckon Lara wins this fight. I don't know much about his opponent, but obviously Lara's got better. In my opinion, Lara's got very good experience. He's fought like Canelo. In the future, as 154, I can see he have some big fights. A fight that I'd like to see is him and Golovkin. Yeah, that's a question that I don't think we asked Austin Trout last week when we spoke to him, but that would have been quite good to see what he thought about that fight. But again, what weight would it be at? Because, you know, uh, Golovkin, uh, yeah, that's another conversation really. But Golovkin's obviously at 160. Lara's pretty comfortable at 154. I think he would be sitting there. I don't think he'd want to put on any more pounds because I think he's a bit of a small 154, to be honest. But yeah, again, a very crafty fighter with a big future. Okay, moving over to Saturday now. There's a massive fight on if you're a British boxing fan, if you're a heavyweight boxing fan. Vladimir Klitschko defends all of his titles. We could be here all day naming which ones they are. He's got every title but the WBC, which is held by Deontay Wilder. I would give you the option to start elsewhere, Ayaz, but I know that you would want to start with this fight. It's over in Dusseldorf. It's in um, the sort of proclaimed backyard now of Vladimir Klitschko, all these fights in Germany that he keeps having. How do you see this fight unfolding, Ayaz? In my opinion, this is going to be a very good fight. Obviously, I was at the press conference um, in Brentford when uh, Tyson Fury came in in a yellow Lamborghini and dressed up as Batman. And you try yeah. to get into Vladimir Klitschko under, under his skin. This fight is going to be very good. Obviously, it's meant to happen October 24th, but because Vladimir Klitschko pulled a calf injury, he got pushed, back to, uh, he got pushed forward to November. This is going to be a very good fight, yeah. But a lot of people are writing off Fury, yeah. But anything can happen in boxing. Obviously, Klitschko is a very, in my opinion, he's, he's like one of the greatest heavyweights of all. If I have to edge it, it'll probably be Klitschko on points. Again, I really hope that, that Fury can do it. And I've got loyalties that lay deep within the Fury family. I know them all personally. They're all great guys. Um, I'm not going to go on record and go against them. I think he can do it. I'm dying for, for us to have another British world champion at heavyweight. I'm dying for that to happen. And the, what a character, what a, you know, fantastic man for the sport. He brings a lot of excitement, unpredictability. And, you know, I'd love him to do it. So I hope he can do it. And I do think he'll cause a lot of problems. This is definitely not going to be a cakewalk for Vladimir Klitschko. Absolutely not. Uh, down that card, Huey Fury, his opponent pulled out at the last minute, but they've now got a replacement, so I'm told, a guy called Adnan Redzovic. Now, Adnan Redzovic has a record of 16 and 1. He hasn't really fought any any top top sort of elite fighters in in the division. He's only six foot two as well. So again, this is gonna probably be a showcase fight for Huey Fury as he looks to move to 18 and 0. John O'Carroll is also on the bill. He's he's looking to move to 9 and 0, but his opponent to my knowledge, hasn't been announced yet. So that's really it for Germany. You know, there's a lot going on over there, you know, in terms of big fights, but not many fights on the card. BoxRec has three fights listed, and that's the John O'Carroll fight, the Huey Fury fight, and then obviously the Tyson Fury fight. That's all it has. Um, we're going to move over to Quebec now. 
James DeGale tops the bill. He fights Canada's very own Lucian Boutte. How do you see this fight going? This is a very tough fight for um, James DeGale. Lucian Boutte, obviously, we know. Carl, he fought Carl Fox and Carl Fox just dethroned him. This, in my opinion, if I have to give it to, if I have to, if I have to give it to a fight, that's gonna, in my opinion, that's going to win. I reckon De Gea wins on points. I've been listening to a few people's predictions, and a lot of people think that that Groves will knock him out. Uh, sorry, not Groves will knock him out. De Gea will knock him out. You'll have to forgive me for that if he's listening. He travelled over to Quebec, Canada, in 2013. So that's only two and a half years ago so he has fought out there before he got a KO in the second round he fought a guy called Sebastian Demers but obviously that's not the same type of opponent as Lucian Butte but again Lucian Butte you know he's aged now I think he's over the hill now remember he got the the loss to Jean Pascal back in 2014 he's only got the one win since then which was three months ago when he fought Andrea Di Luisa he got a fourth round TKO victory there so Butte's record is now 32 and 2 and James DeGale 21 and 1 that one blemish of of course to George Groves I think James DeGale stops him if I'm honest I think James DeGale stops him remember uh, Butte Although he had a fight three months ago, he's been quite inactive. Obviously, he got stopped in the fifth round to Carl Froch. That was back in 2012, so three years ago, three and a half years ago. He's only had four fights in three and a half years, and his record of those four fights is two wins, two losses. So he's definitely on the decline. But again, losing to Carl Froch and losing to Jean Pascal is no humiliation or anything like that. They're, they're two top fighters, two champs. But I think that De Gaulle wins this and I'm pretty happy that he's actually been out to Quebec and fought over there before. That's good because a lot of fighters don't travel too well, but we know he's gone over there and got an early knockout. So perhaps he could get another early knockout. There's another fighter I want to mention on that bill, actually, while we're here. Amir Imam, he's also on the bill. He looks to move to 19 and 0. He's obviously 18 and 0 at the moment. Any other fights on the Saturday, there is a card over in Italy. Carlos Takam, obviously the heavyweight fighter, he he fights George Arias. Now, George Arias, we remember, fought Huey Fury, and Huey Fury managed to beat him. That was on points in 2015, yeah, back in July. So, George Arias, his last two fights were two losses. The points lost to Huey Fury in July. And then back in October, just last month, Kubrat Pulev beat him over an eight round you know, decision, unanimous decision. So now he fights Carlos Takam. And obviously, Carlos Takam is regarded as one of the top boys, despite his two losses. One to Povetkin back in 2014. He's got one draw with Mike Perez. And he's got a loss early in his career back in 2009 to a guy who was undefeated. But yeah, Takam, since the Povetkin loss in 2014, he's fought Marcelo Luis Nascimento, who's a bit of a journeyman. He got him out of there in the fourth round KO. He also fought Michael Sprott back in June of this year, and he KO'd him in the fifth round. So two knockout wins since the loss to Povetkin, which was a 10th round knockout in Russia. So Takam should get through this fight pretty easy. Again, it's a bit of a strange card. It's in Italy. These two fighters fighting in Italy, it's a bit of a strange one. Over in Dallas, Texas, Errol Spence Jr., he's back out. A lot of people regard this guy as one of the future pound-for-pound stars. He is looking to move to 19-0. and 0. He fights Alejandro Barrera, who's 28-2. and 2. Bit crafty, Barrera, by the way. This is going to be a bit of a tough fight for Errol Spence, in my opinion, to be honest, because, you know, the guy is a... He's 154, he's 29. Like I say, he's quite experienced. He's had the 30 fights now, Um of those 28 wins, he's got 18 by knockout. His two losses were to guys who weren't very notable. But I've seen this guy fight, and he's a little bit crafty. So this should be interesting. And it's another test for Errol Spence Jr. No one's complaining about that. You know, we all complain when when these prospects are fed these easy fights. This is not one of them. But I could be wrong because the talent of this guy, you know, it's, the sky's the limit for people like Errol Spence. Also on that bill, Jamal Charlo. Again, I get confused with these two. Austin Trout, who we spoke to last week, said that both of the brothers are in his top five at 154 if he took himself out of the equation. He's 22 and 0, Jamal Charlo. He fights Wilkie Kampfer, who's 21 and 1. 
that's also on that card, on the undercard of Errol Spence Jr. So that should be a good fight. And that's really the end of the preview part of the show. We whizzed through it this week. A couple of bits of news. Just this week, David Hay has announced he's going to be returning to the ring on January the 16th. Tickets go on sale for that this week. He fights Mark Damori. I was at the press conference. He got a little bit tasty there. Mark Damori decided to put his nut on David Hay and shoved him back a little bit with his head, to which David Hay told him to calm down and relax. And there's going to be plenty of time for that, my son. So, yeah, everyone should, you know, stay tuned for that. It was quite a lively press conference. You can probably find it on YouTube somewhere. And also, there's a second bit of news that we're going to bring you. It's just been announced. I'm going to let Ayaz bring you this news. Ayaz? Danny Garcia has just announced his fight against Robert Guerrero. And that fight is on the 23rd of January, uh, 2016, on a Saturday night. It's good because, like I say, David Hay announced his comeback fight this week. And then one week later, we've got Danny Garcia, Robert Guerrero. Again, this fight, Ayers, how do you see that guy? And I know it's a long way away, but we're just going to talk about it here. No doubt we'll talk about it closer to the time. But this far out, we'll see if any of our opinions change from now up until the fight, up until the, the week before when we do the preview. How do you see it going? Because in my personal opinion, I'm not going to get too much into it, but I just think Easy win for Garcia. Do you know what? Before we before I talk about this fight in a quick brief detail, I actually thought Amir Khan was going to fight Danny Garcia. A lot of a lot of Khan fans were thinking, right, Khan's fight in January is going to be against Garcia. And then I found out Danny Garcia fights Robert Guerrero, but in my opinion, Garcia wins that fight and Garcia knocks him out. The only thing with this is Robert Guerrero. I'm not knocking him. He's a very tough, tough, tough man. He really is. He's a tough, tough, tough man. And he can take a lot of punishment. Remember, he had a he had a big fight with, with Keith Furman. He took a lot of punishment in that fight. And I think that Keith Furman's much more explosive than Danny Garcia is. I think he's more of a, you know, danger man than Danny Garcia is. So I'm not sure if he's going to get him out of there, but I think he'll beat him pretty well. But then again, you can't count Guerrero out. And I think since the Mayweather fight, he's kind of gone downhill. I don't think he's, you know, the same fighter. I don't think he's going to win, but he can make it ugly for Garcia. And that's what we want to see, because whenever any other fighters made it ugly for Garcia, people like Lamont Peterson, people like, you know, good boxers, just like Gar uh, Guerrero, sorry, Guerrero can box well. And he could potentially pose a lot of problems for Garcia. No one really looks fantastic against Guerrero, apart from Mayweather, of course. So it should be interesting, that fight. But again, we'll get in-depth in that when the fight comes round on January the 23rd. So that's it for the second part of the show. And we're going to bring on our second guest this week. OK, it's time for our second guest on this week's show. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Silky Wilkie Campfort. Wilkie, welcome to the show, sir. Hey, thank you, man. Thanks for having me, guys. How you guys doing this morning? No problem, no problem. It's actually the evening where we are over in UK, but oh, yeah, thanks okay. <laughs> nonetheless. <laughs> yeah, yeah okay. I'm in I'm in Florida. I'm in Florida. It's morning for me right now. It's eleven. Uh, it's eleven o'clock. Eleven on eleven thirty right now. Okay. Um. Now I watched your last fight, Wilkie. I watched your fight. Um. On PBC, of course, and. Mm -hmm. I think it was quite impressive. I mean, it was a bit of a war. It only went two rounds, of course. But what I noticed yeah. is you was knocked down in the first round and you, you wasn't hurt. You got straight back up. And what uh -huh. I noticed and what I was quite impressed by was the fact that you jumped straight back up. And a lot of guys get back up and they, they're on the back foot. Now, you were straight on the front foot, which showed a lot of bravado, but smart bravado, calculated bravado. Mm -hmm. You was covering up mm -hmm. and countering effectively. And that impresses me. And that's very good to see. You possess a very good right hook and a very good left hook. And, of course, you took him out in the second round. You knocked him down three times and he was basically finished and the referee stopped it. Yeah. Um, firstly, do you think that's ideal preparation for, for the world title fight you've got at the weekend? Because, in my opinion, uh, I think that's, that's brilliant. That fight right there, that fight right there, I learned a lot in that fight because the reason I said that it was my first time been knocked down Pros or amateurs or in sparring never been knocked down before, so it was my first time. And then when I went down, it wasn't like I was hurt or anything. I've seen him; he was throwing, getting ready to throw a right hand, 
And as I was backing out and stuff, and then he, boom, he caught me at the end of his punches, and I went down. As you said, I got back up and then did what I had to do and got him out of there. But he was a very, very tough opponent. He came to win. He came to win, but I, I couldn't let him beat me right there in my, in, my, in my backyard and stuff. And so I did what I had to do to get him out of there. But it was a great experience, and I enjoyed that fight a lot. And now, of course, on Saturday, you're fighting uh, Jamal Charlo. Now, mm-hmm. these two Charlo brothers, they're a bit of a force in the, in, in the 154 class. Which brother, uh-huh. do you think, which brother do you think is the better brother? Uh, I think the one I'm fighting, I think he's the best. Because the reason why the other one, his style, he has a... I mean, I look at him like that, though. He has a very boring style. He started just to run around the ring and stuff and Peter the and stuff like that. But the other brother, the one I'm fighting by him, he's a straight forward coming fire uh, fighters and stuff like he gets in the ring with, he comes in the ring with bad attitude, he comes in there to get you out of there. And then which is like me and him, I have the same attitude. Once I get in the ring, I go after my opponent. There's no boring fight. There's no fight that I've been in. has been any any kind of boring fight them. I think me and him we gotta have we have the same similar style and stuff like that. But I mean November twenty eighth of May will be a good show to remember. I I believe the one that I'm fighting I think is the better fight than the other one. And now of course your record at the moment is twenty one wins and the one loss. Twelve of those wins coming mm-hmm. by knockout. And your one loss um isn't something that's been you know brought up as a big thing because if anybody knows your record, they know who you are. They'll know your first loss yeah. was in the first year you turned pro, and it was a majority yeah. decision over four rounds, but you was robbed. It was in the yeah. guy's backyard. So that's not something that should be, you know, some sort yeah. of confidence. Yeah, my first, my, first, my, 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 my first loss, though, man, I learned a lot from that loss, though, man. I still, but at the same time, I still look at myself as an undefeated fighter because the reason why, because everybody was there that night, they knew who won the fight, though, you know, clearly, look, but how you know, you know the politics that comes with boxing and stuff. I was in his hometown on his promoter shows and stuff. And then, you know, and I let the fight got a little bit closer, but you know, he wasn't going to give it to me, so they give it to him. But at the same time, I still look at myself like, uh, you know, I have that loss on, on my record. I still look at myself as an undefeated fighter. But that loss, so I also learned a lot from that loss. So I learned not to let a not to let it go in the judge's hands and stuff like that. If so, I got to do every, I got to win every, every round impressively. Yeah. And also again, it was only your second fight in and it wasn't really a real loss, but I understand what you mean by that. Um, now you're in the yeah. 154 division, the light middleweight division. It's a very highly skilled division. There's a lot going on at the moment. Of course, Canelo fought at the weekend. He fought Cotto tonight. You've got Eris Landy Lara fighting, for his world title, you're on the weekend, of course, um, Jamal Charlo. How do you mm-hmm. see the division at the moment? Is it one of the strongest times it has been? Is it is it sort of the strongest time for the 154 division at the moment, in your opinion? It's. A, I think the 154, the 154 weight class, and the 147. I think those two weight divisions right now are the most, like, are the most like uh, those, those two weight divisions right now. They they stack them in with talent with guys with skills and stuff like that i mean i look at it like this though, I man. like my main focus right now is on uh is on jamar charlo once i get passed by him what i would like i would like to unify the title either i get in there with uh either canelo or, or laura either one of those guys you know so i'm not like I'm not, I'm not looking past i'm not looking past charlo but at the same time my goal in the future is just like just to try to unify the title but at the same time it's a very very stacked very, very, very stacked division and stuff like that. But I have to get past Charlie to get to be on uh to be on that list of maybe one of the top guys in that division. So that's what I'm working on right now. And without doubt, this fight is going to be your biggest fight thus far, your hardest fight thus far. Um, yes, yes, it is. <laughs> are you one of those guys who rises to the occasion and possibly performs better under pressure? Uh, I, I fight, I fight, I fight better. Like I just see most of my fights, they've been like uh, most of my fights been on the road and stuff. I've been going to my opponent backyard to fight him, and then where they once I once it's time for me to walk to the ring and start, they start booing me. It's like I don't like fighting at home though, because the reason why when you fighting at home, it's just like you got friends, family, everybody want to everybody want to come and blah blah blah. But when I go fighting my opponent backyard and stuff, like I fight. I fight better because the reason why, because the crowd, I know the crowd are not for me. And by them booing me, it gives me more energy to do what I have to do, you know, do what I have to do just to get my opponent out of there. 
you know. But I, I love fighting under pressure, though, man. But it's not it's not pressure, but because that's what we do. We, I'm a fighter, but at the same time, I, I love when not with the odds against me. I love it. What's What's your favorite British fighter of all time, Silky? My favorite British fighters. I love. Uh, I like David Hayes. He's one of my favorite. I like uh, David Hayes, and then uh, what's the name? Old school, old school, middle, super middleweight guy, super middleweight. His son is a fighter right now. Uh, yeah. Eubank. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like I like his style a lot, though. Man, I love his style, though, man. And I like uh uh, damn, what's his name? He was a little fighter, man. He was like fighting at one one thirty. Like he's uh, he's retired right now. Long time ago, but he only lost one fight. He lost to uh, to Barrera, you know. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, Prince Nassim Hamid. Yeah, Prince Nassim is one of those those two those three guys are like the three of my favorites and stuff like that. You know, I love their style. I love I love them a lot. That flashy style. Yeah, I actually saw David Hay yesterday. He's making a comeback now. Uh, he's fighting a guy called Mark Demori in January. Yeah, Mark I hope. I, 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 yeah, I hope so, man. Because he's a he's a. David Hayes is one of those guys that man is very explosive in the ring and his defense is like you know I think to me he's like he's like one of the best of all time though man you know what I mean so I really hope he gets back in the ring and do what he loves to do you know and for for for, for a good show for us. And as for Chris Eubank, um, obviously he's got a son also called Chris Eubank Jr. He's got a big fight coming up mm-hmm. in December. Yeah. But- Right now, I'm not sure if you're aware, but the dad is on a game show. It's a UK game show, but it's it's based mm-hmm. in Australia in the jungle. It's called I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out of Here. It's a big show on terrestrial oh. TV over oh. here. It's probably not over there, but oh. they... Um, I don't know if it's, on, if, it, if, it's, if it's on YouTube, maybe like later on today, though, man, I check it out on YouTube or something like that, though, you know? Yeah, it's called I'm a Celebrity, Get Me Out of Here, and they make the celebrities do the most disgustingest things and the most, like, oh. I don't know, they'll throw, like, thousands of cockroaches over you whilst you're in a coffin. They make you eat grotesque animal body parts. Oh, it's really crazy. disgusting. But, um, yeah, it's oh, just interesting man. you brought those two guys up and they've got a lot going on right now. But, anyway, back to boxing. Yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> you've been through a few tough times. I know that... Back a while back, a couple of years ago, you had no manager, no promoter. What mm-hmm. what's going on now? Who are you managed by? Who are you promoted by now, Wilkie? Uh, I don't have a promoter right now, but I just uh, recently, like uh, like uh, last year around this time in November, I got signed with uh, I got signed to uh, him and promotion and stuff like that. You know, like uh, but at the t- at the same time, right, I don't have a promoter. I just have a manager right now. I just have him as my manager. That's about it. Yeah, because I know that, that you went for a bit of a time where you was getting people ring you up and ask you if you wanted to fight in a few days' time. You wasn't getting the proper. Oh yeah, that's that what I got. That, that, that's what I had. That's what I had to do to get to this position that I am right now. You know, that's what I had to do to get to this. Like, it's just like the thing is, I'm like one of those guys that I stay in the gym. You know, even with this fight, with this fight, it's a worst out of fight. They're only getting like five weeks to get ready for this fight. You know, so imagine if I was in shape, if I wasn't in the gym training. I wouldn't be in. Sh- I wouldn't. I would. There's no way. There's no. There's no way possible. I would be able to get in shape like in five weeks to get ready for a world title fight. So I stay in the gym. I, me and my, me and my wife, we own a gym. They called Bulldog Boxing and Fitness over in this uh, Tampa area. And then there we train a lot of kids and stuff like that. We do fitness classes and things like that. So I'm always there at the gym, like helping out the kids and stuff like that, you know. And then doing classes. So they help me stay in, in, stay in, in some kind of shape, you know. You know, that's very, very, very nice to hear that. That's very good. Um, you mm-hmm. know, if this is one of your longest sort of notices for a fight and you've been able to win every single fight, basically, apart from that mm-hmm. silly loss, then yeah. then it, it's, it's good because if you're winning all these fights, then with a longer training camp and more preparation time, you should get the win. So, like I say, you, you've been through some dark times, no promoter, no manager, no long notice for fights. Are you happy in your career right now, despite, I know that you've obviously got the world title fight coming up on Saturday, but despite of that, leaving that out, are you happy in your career right now? I mean, before be, before it was a little bit disappointing and stuff like that, because the reason why I said that it was so hard to get fights and stuff, you know, like in one year, like a, like a, in one year, like a, I would say like two years ago, I went to, uh, to seven different training camps, and then all seven fights fell off. Cause the reason why, cause we couldn't, I couldn't, I don't know, I don't know, cause the, the reason, like I couldn't get, I couldn't get no fight. It was so hard to get fights and stuff like that. But you know, like right now, 
I'm very happy the way the way out him and how uh, him and then the way they did uh the managing my career, the way they got in my career. I'm very happy right now with my career and stuff like that, you know. Everything happened in life for a reason, but I believe God put them in my life, but man put 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 out him and them in my life for a reason. So right now I'm very happy the way my career is going right now, you know, thanks to Al Heyman. You know, they're doing a great job on me so far. Okay, and I'm gonna we're gonna end this on obviously massive fight on Saturday. I've got my fingers crossed for you. How do you see this okay. fight going? How do you see this fight going? Do you reckon it's gonna be points? You can break down the fight for me. I'll let you get on with that. Uh, like this fight right here, I don't see, like, I look at it like this, but man, I don't see this fight. I always say that before each one of my fights. I don't see this fight going to decision because the reason why this kid is a very explosive kid. He's going to come in there trying to knock me out, and I'm going to go in there trying to do the same, trying to get him out of that face. It's like this, so whoever gets who first, though, man, but I don't see this fight going to decision, going to all the way to 12 rounds and stuff. It's going to be a very entertaining fight, you know? I'm supposed to um, remain unbiased, but after talking to you, I must say I really hope that you get this win. I think you deserve it. Uh, been hey, talking to you, you, you. T- talking to you has been an absolute pleasure, and hopefully we can catch up sometime after the fight. Thank you very much for coming, nah, on Silky Walkie. Hopefully, you guys can fight over the you, you guys. I would love to come to UK, man. Never been out there before. I would love to come over there, man. You know, just to visit and stuff like that. So, hopefully, one day I'll be able to come over there or fight over there and stuff like that for the UK fans. Absolutely. We'd welcome you with open arms. Thank you very much for coming on the show, Silky. And I wish you the best of luck for the weekend. And hopefully, next time we speak, you'll be the new IBF champion of the world. Hey, God willing. Thank you very much. I really appreciate it. So, you have a great day. God bless you too, sir. All right. God bless. Bye-bye. Okay, it's time to draw episode 10 to a close. It's been an absolute pleasure bringing you the show this week. Thank you very much if you've listened this far. I've been your host, Mr. Joey Coastman. Ayaz Sumra has been Ayaz Sumra. Thank you to our two guests, the English flyweight champion, Mr. Charlie Edwards, and world title challenger for this weekend, Mr. Silky Wilkie Campfoot, who we've got our fingers crossed for here, and hopefully he can pull the win off. Thank you for listening this week. If you could all please follow, please retweet, please subscribe please share please like that would be absolutely fantastic thank you very much and we hope to see you next week take care